Section 24 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The Philosophy of Gambling. There is a season of the year when even the most steady going of men and women are incited by the winds of spring to take an interest in the affairs of the turf, even to the extent of hazarding pieces of gold on the behaviour of horses of which they have not previously heard. This being so, it is hardly astonishing that a poet should, for once in a way, write a sporting article, though I have no intention of discussing the chances of the horses entered for the derby, beyond remarking that Tresidy is a prettier name than Lemberg or Neil Garve. It is the sportsmen rather than the horses that interest me, and when a race is over, I always look around to see how losers are taking their losses. When an Englishman meets with disaster, he does not swear or weep or depose his fetishes. He adapts his face to a mark of unconcern, and fixes his eyes on eternity, lest any human being should detect an un-English upheaval within. England, of all nations, is the nation of gamblers, but it knows how to lose almost better than it knows how to win. Yet in this passion for taking risks, and even more, perhaps, in this stoicism in face of defeat, it is easy to trace one of the principal causes of our extraordinary success as a nation. It must have occurred to every one who has studied the voyages of English seamen in the pages of Hackloot and Perchas that few of these expeditions could be described as sound commercial transactions. And ignoring this trait of the English character, one would be compelled to wonder not that Englishmen should be prepared to risk their lives on such enchanting ventures, but that staid London merchants should be willing to finance them. Sometimes these little ships brought back diaries of strange adventure, written in naive and charming English. Sometimes they did not come back at all. But rarely, I fancy, can they have brought much treasure in gold and spices to the imaginative capitalists who equipped them. Yet the game went on, and while the adventurous vessels cruised happily in unknown seas, the merchants who owned them dreamed over their musty ledgers. They would have diamonds and rubies enough when their ships came home. There is something significant in the pleasant English phrase. I suppose it seems a far cry from the sea-washed Indies to pastoral Epsom Downs, from the gentlemen adventurers of Elizabeth to those other gentlemen who will lose their money with a calm brave on Derby Day. And yet I think it is only another instance of the way in which civilization preserves the primitive passions while changing a manner of expressing these passions. I am not sure there is any deterioration. It is only our lack of imagination that makes the present seem so sordid. We know that those little ships were badly provisioned and utterly dirty. We know that their crews frequently mutinied, and that the officers quarrelled among themselves and cheated their employers. They would murder natives on the smallest provocation. Probably they did not wash. Against these things you may set an almost animal courage and a not unimaginative patriotism that permitted them to steal and murder with a good heart. A modern race-course crowd, considered in bulk, will be found to share these attributes. It is dirty, ill-provisioned, quarrelsome, and dishonest. But, as last Derby Day proved, it is the most loyal crowd in the world, and it would be idle to deny it the courage of the gambler. The race-course mob has another quality that it would be unjust to ignore. It is insanely generous. I have an ancestor, so runs the dearest of my family traditions, who was hanged as a pirate by the Spaniards at Port Royal. How much of that priceless piratical blood the centuries may have transmitted to me, I do not know, but if I were his very reincarnation, I could hardly hoist the Jolly Roger in an age that may believe in fairies, but certainly does not believe in pirates. A modern Captain Flint would be driven off the high seas by the journalists. They would count his pistols and measure his black flag and publish interviews with his schoolfellows. It would be impossible for him to maintain the correct atmosphere of mysterious cruelty when Tiny Tots had given its little readers a photograph of his pet rabbit. Besides, he could make a better living on the halls. 
this being so i must needs find another outlet for my fraction of my ancestor's adventurous spirit and i find it not unworthily i hope in the occasional backing of outsiders there is much to be said for this kind of adventure in the first place it enables you to back your fancy on the only sound system of betting on horses with agreeable names others may burden their minds with tedious histories of pedigrees and previous runnings you are at liberty to let your eyes roam over the card in search of pleasant gatherings of vowels and consonants sometimes mischance will lead you to select a horse the cramped price of which suggests that it may possibly win but there is no need to be disheartened you have only to choose again nor in the long run is there any risk of success turning these idyllic speculations into commercial transactions now and again perhaps the heavens will fall and your ship will come home laden with gold and silk and ruddy wine but on the whole your ledgers if you keep them will tell a long tale of wrecks and downed men with uncanny swift disasters amply compensated for however by the thrills that are the true rewards of the adventurous bookmakers too are very pleasant to you if you bet on this principle when i made my investment on the last derby at a delightful price the bookmaker turned to me with a charming smile i hope i shall have the pleasure of paying you he said i fear backers or favourites rarely receive such courtesy it is a fact that if you are not a carnegie or a rockefeller an occasional bet provides an admirable foundation for the building of dream palaces when i back a winner is a phrase that leads up pleasantly to the spending of a deal of fairy gold and the best of this kind of shopping is that if you're expert at it the possession of the real gold that is so hard to win becomes in a sense unnecessary if you purchase a thing a hundred times in dreams and then find that you still really desire it your imagination wants looking to but i really do not know how the nonconformists can call a betting sordid i hold no brief for the facial beauty of bookmakers nor do i find grandstands the last word in architecture but when a man makes a bet he is simply seeking for something that he thinks necessary to complete his life it may be beer or it may be diamonds to deck an actress's leg but in either case it represents an ideal a human aspiration and as such is not to be despised if betting which after all is the simplest if the least reliable way of trying to make money is sordid then must all ways of making money be sordid but as a matter of fact few people bet as a means of procuring necessaries whenever i see any one putting money on a horse i see a man gambling it may be but nevertheless striving ever for beauty as he conceives it when i see a man earning his living i see a truculent stomach and now as this is a real sporting article i will end with the story of the turf at one of the smaller meetings there was entered in a selling plate a horse called pegasus of which even the most cunning tout knew nothing whatever as the handicappers were equally ignorant they gave it the welter weight of ten stone and hoped for the best when the market opened on the race the horse travelled badly in fact nobody would put a penny on pegasus and fifties were vainly proffered after the experts had examined the sorry crew and the extraordinary person who calling himself the owner proposed to ride it the denouement you will probably have foreseen when the tapes flew up pegasus unfolded a gorgeous pair of amethyst in wings and fluttered coolly down the coast to win by a distance you can imagine the gaping crowd the horror of the s p offices the joy of the poet and his friends but the sequel is strange at the subsequent auction a jew bought pegasus for fifty thousand guineas after a brisk competition the race fund prospered and the owner of the second but pegasus never flew another yard and the jew is a sad man because the poet will not tell him what dope he used end of section 24 recording by s k edison new jersey section 25 of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The Poet Who Was. There are some illusions which no man who has formed a high conception of life will readily allow to die. We cling to them because we realize that there is a wisdom that lies beyond the truth as we can see it, a wisdom that holds itself aloof from our timid doubts and reasonings. Of these immortal illusions, there is one that is of special value to the artist. He must believe, however often circumstances appear to give him the lie, that great work can only be done by great men. The first work of every creative artist is to create his own character, and if he fails here through weakness or carelessness, that failure will be expressed and emphasized in his artistic work. So, if admiring grapes we find ourselves confronted with the bramble that has produced them, we must form one of two conclusions. Either the grapes are not true grapes, but dead sea fruit, bloom without and ashes within, or we lack the sympathetic insight that would enable us to detect the authentic vine in the heart of a briar. Years ago there appeared a volume of poems for which I have ever had a great admiration, and holding this illusion beyond all others, I always wished to meet the man who wrote them. He was, I knew, engaged in work that could hardly be grateful to a poet, and he was not to be encountered in ordinary literary circles. Still, whenever I read his book, I felt sure that sooner or later I should meet this man and like him. His poetry appealed to my more individual emotions, expressing moods with which I was personally familiar. Meanwhile, till I might know him better, I contented myself with writing in praise of his poems whenever I had the opportunity. Then one day I found a distinguished man of letters, and the most enthusiastic of English editors, sitting together in a Regent Street café. We fell to talking of the man and his poems. We all admired his work, and therefore we all wished to meet him. It's easy enough, cried the man of letters, and after all we know the man through his book. We'll write him a mutual invitation tonight and take him out to lunch tomorrow. There was something gallant in the idea, for we risked being snubbed, which is the last adventure an Englishman cares to have. We wrote the letter and sent it off. The next morning was one of those rare and splendid days, of which only England seems to have the secret, days when the wind is sweet and cool like a russet apple and the warm sunshine follows close at its heels before one has time to be chilled. It seemed a good day on which to make a new friend. We called for our poet, and received a message that he would be pleased to come with us in an hour's time. So we went into Regent's Park and watched the squirrels playing with their nursemaids, and thrusting their inquisitive noses into the flowing hair of little girls. We felt that it was a generous world that gave us sunshine and little squirrels and men who wrote fine songs. It is perhaps foolish to expect men of talent to be either very handsome or very ugly, but I confess that I was disappointed with my first impression of the poet. He looked elderly and insignificant and suggested in some subtle way an undertaker's mute the kind of man who wears black kid gloves too long in the fingers, and generally has a cold in the head. I thought, however, that his eyes might be rather fine in repose, for the whole body and speech of the man were twittering with nervousness, and he affected me like an actor in a cinematograph picture. All nature is the friend of the shy man, and behind this superficial unease we divine qualities of enthusiasm and amiability that would no doubt be patent when this overwhelming timidity had passed away. Looking back, it seems to me that we all worked rather hard to set the man at his ease and find him worthy of his own work. We told him stories, we found mutual friends, we encouraged him to talk, we sympathized with him over his luckless environment, and when called upon we praised and quoted his poetry without stint. 
but still he fluttered like a bird caught in a snare he took his food without enjoyment the sunny wine of france did not warm him a degree we piped to him his own tunes all the tunes of the world and yet he would not dance it was not that he was embarrassed by our compliments he took them for his due as a poet should but he seemed to think that our enthusiasm must have a sinister motive and that it was impossible that any one should have discrimination enough to wish to meet the author of his book for the book's sake nevertheless being optimists in matters of art our faith in the man held true if only we could persuade him to drop the mask of his nervousness we thought at the end of lunch we succeeded and then i think we were all sorry he stood there leaning gently against the table while soured vanity spoke with a stammering tongue it seemed that our little luncheon party was a conspiracy to persuade him to publish some of his poems in the editor's paper and therefore he found it necessary to be rude had his suspicions been true a more modest man might have thought such a plot pardonable or even rather flattering but the terms in which our poet expressed himself placed him beyond argument or sympathy we shook hands and said good-bye and he went away out of our world of sunshine and tame squirrels for ever and ever so far as my companions were concerned the matter ended there their kingdoms were secure and they could afford to laugh at our honourable discomfiture but my kingdom was yet to win and i could not spare the smallest of my illusions if such a man as i had met that day could do the big things art became of a sudden an unworthy mistress to serve i went home and nervously took his book from the shelf wondering how far my new knowledge of the man's personality would spoil my enjoyment of his work i need not have been anxious they were real grapes though perhaps i acknowledge for the first time that their distinctive bitter flavour prevented them from being of the first quality still they were admirable in their kind and i had to satisfy myself how much fruit could have grown on such a vine and then with a flash of intuition i saw the truth the flesh the features the mortal part of the man might survive but i knew as surely as if i had been present at his deathbed that the youth who had written those poems was dead needless to wonder what thwarting of emotion what starvation of appetite had produced that burst of song the important thing to me was to realize that the man himself as we reckon men in the hopeful world had perished in the singing with this knowledge to aid me i could sympathize with the rudeness of the man we had sought to honour for in his heart he knew himself little better than a changeling and with a, the giant's robe of his splendid hour of youth hanging loosely about his shrunken bones he must have found our enthusiasm no more than mockery i have not yet been fortunate enough to meet the author of that book of poems which i have admired so long yet i feel sure that sooner or later i shall meet the man and like him and know that he will be young and think that on his lips his songs will have lost their bitterness for it is a hard thing if we must carry our concern for the roses and our sorrow for the springtide lightness of girls beyond the gateway of the grave End of section 25once devoted a book to the consideration of heroes and hero worshippers these words are said on paper a long way from that 
and most other books, and I cannot recall for the moment the exact attitude he adopted towards hero worshippers, whether he pitied them, patronized them, or admired them. As he was himself undoubtedly a hero, one would expect his motions to vary between compassion and admiration. The strong man's compassion for the weakness and admiration of the strength of the weak. I'm sure, at all events, that he did not fall into the vulgar error of despising hero worshippers, because they're content not to be heroes. Yet, as I write, it seems to me that the very name "hero worshipper" has been spoiled by sneering lips. We are asked to believe that they are only weak-minded enthusiasts with a turn for undiscriminating praise, and that they swallow their heroes as a snake swallows a rabbit, bones and all. Personally, I think this is a bad way in which to eat rabbits, but the best possible way in which to take a great man. I detest the cheese-paring enthusiasm that accepts the Olympian head and rejects the feet of human clay. Until Frank Harris taught me better, I thought Shakespeare's sonnets were capable of but one probable interpretation. But I did not wag my head with a moralist brownie and cry, "The less Shakespeare, he." Today I do not find Shakespeare less great because he loved Mary Fitton. It seems impossible that anyone should. Yet more burned Byron's autobiography. Ruskin would not write a life of Turner because of the nature of his relationship with women. Stevenson abandoned an essay on Hazlitt because of the labor amorous Stevenson, whose essay on Robert Burns swells to heaven. In the face of such spectacles. As these, it is surely legitimate to pine for the blind generosity of the enthusiasts, the incautious fullness of appreciation that lifts great men with their due complement of vices and follies onto higher plane where the ordinary conventions of human conduct no longer apply. Great men are usually credited with an enormous confidence in their own ability, but often enough they have been distinguished for their modesty. And arrogance has only come late in life to support their failing powers of creation. In fact, it may be said that no man, even the most conceited, is assured of his own heroic qualities till someone tells him of them. And thus far, it would seem that the hero worshipper creates the hero. One enthusiast can create many heroes, which possibly accounts for the fact that we find in life that heroes are far more numerous than hero worshippers. Nearly everyone possesses the heroic qualities in Pozzi. The gift of appreciation is proportionally rare. Every day there are more great men and fewer admirers of greatness in men. In the next generation, Superman will be so common that it will become a distinction to belong to Christ's democracy. The standard example of hero worship. Is Boswell's *Life of Johnson* a book whose greatness is universally admitted, and it may be added universally misconstrued? If we are to class biographies by their utility, it loses its preeminence, for we would have derived a considerable and insufficient knowledge of Johnson from the pages of Piozzi, Hawkins, and others. Whereas, if the matchless prig Austen Leigh had not written the life of his aunt Jane Austen. We should have known practically nothing of this inspired miniature painter, less certainly than we know of Shakespeare. But of course, the greatness of Boswell's Johnson rests with Boswell, and not with Johnson at all. Johnson had all the traditional virtues and vices of the mythical average Englishman. He was brave, honest, obstinate, intolerant, and ill-mannered. He was all these things with a violence to shake society, as his vast body shook the floors of houses. It is this violence that marks him out as an exceptional man. For violence of any kind is abnormal, but it is safe to say that for one Boswell there will be born a hundred Johnsons. In terms of literature, Johnson is only of interest as being the protagonist of Boswell's masterpiece. If his lives of the poets still exist. To irritate the unwary, Irene and Rasselas are dead and buried. For all his greatness, Johnson had not the wit to win for himself his measure of immortality. It needs the magic of Boswell's pen to put life into his dead bones. He displays his hand in many parts as a learned pig, as a sulky child, 
as Falstaff and happily though enough often as a simple kind-hearted man but whatever the role Bowles will never forget to impress us with the fact that this is a man to be admired he shows us johnson bellowing at the thought of death he tells us that he was a brave man and we believe him johnson apart boswell's life is a masterpiece of self-revelation he is so honest as an artist that he makes no effort to hide the petty dishonesty of his own nature he tells us how he won the tolerance of johnson and indeed made himself necessary to him by means of skilful flattery this signifies but little for shakespeare did not scruple to flatter elizabeth and pembroke the greater folk of the moment we are most of us unwilling to flatter great men if it gives them pleasure but unlike boswell we do not subsequently explain the process at full length in a book it reminds us of pips taking careful note of his peccadilloes but pips did not always remember that he intended posterity to read his diary boswell wrote without thought of concealment handed his portrait of johnson and his no less conscious portrait of himself to his own generation and ever since has been regarded as a kind of thick-headed parasite for his pains boswell was not an intellectual man in the sense that johnson was intellectual but he had a wonderful knowledge of human motives and an appreciation of johnson that brought out the latent genius in him and ended by making the expression of his admiration more admirable than the man admired johnson is as dead as garrick boswell lives with the great ones of english literature the hero worshipper has outlived the hero as a rule it is to be feared that appreciation is a gift granted only to the young in our green unknowing days we used to divide books into masterpieces and miserable rubbish the classification is convenient but as our minds wear out and we become wise the tendency is to find no more masterpieces those were great nights when we used to read each other's verses and congratulate the world on its possession of our united genius that is really the poet's hour his rich reward for years of unprofitable labor when the poets of his own unrep age receive his work with enthusiasm an enthusiasm which in all honesty and all modesty he shares himself unhappily he is paid in advance sooner or later he wakes to find that he is worshipping before the shrine of his own genius and the shrine is empty that is why i am half pleased and half melancholy when young men tell me that antony starbright aged twenty is the greatest poet since keats if they only knew that i too in my hour was one of a group of greatest poets who all wrote poems to pen and hylas when on summer nights that sometimes stretched far into summer mornings we were all hero worshippers together and we ourselves were the heroes there is a box at the strand end of waterloo bridge which is always brimful of the works of new poets and i can never pass it without pausing to look at the little neatly bound volumes which say so little and mean so much all the enthusiasms all the illusions of youth are there printed with broad margins and bound in imitation vellum i turn the pages that brutal critics have not troubled to cut and bitterly lament the blindness that make it impossible for me to know what the young men who wrote them really wanted to say but it pleases me to think that each of those little books has its own appreciative public some half dozen young men who know the author and can read the greatness and pride of his youth between the retirement lines of his work end of section twenty six section twenty seven of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Monologues by Richard Middleton. 
Poets and Critics When a short time ago I came across a book by the Poet Laureate entitled The Bridling of Pegasus, I confess that the title alarmed me. I do not want the present century to capture the winged horse. I should be sorry to see poor Pegasus munching gilded oats at a banquet of the Poetry Society. Nor do I wish to find his photograph among the grinning actresses in the illustrated papers. But an examination of Mr. Austin's book soon reassured me. He has not bridled Pegasus. He has not even succeeded in harnessing Rosinante. But by a natural error he has hung his bridle on to a spotted wooden steed of great age. That served perhaps to amuse some of our less considerable poets in their infancy. Mr. Austin's criticism is as individual as his poetry, and far more stimulating. I do not think that any poet could read The Bridling of Pegasus without being roused to passionate anger. It is as though a village schoolmaster had paid a week-end visit to the foot of the Parnassus, and had embodied his miscomprehension of what he had seen in the form of a series of lectures to his apple-cheeked pupils. Here you have the condescension, the assertive ignorance, the occasional smirking humor. Let the little boys write on their slates Mr. Austin's assertion that Byron is the greatest English poet since Milton, and let them add that Mr. Austin is the most irritating critic since Remus. One of these statements is true. It is too late in the day to review the bridling of Pegasus, but it suggests the fitness of some inquiry into the relationship between poets and critics. It is, of course, as natural for critics to dislike the work of young and adventurous poets as it is for poets to dislike the writings of aged and sophisticated critics. For critics of all men who work in words love to support themselves on those mysterious crutches known as canons of art, which any new poet worthy of the name promptly sends flying with the spirit of his winged foot. This is not to say that the canons of art, <laughs> the artillery of small bore, may not have certain value for critics, but poets, when they fall to criticizing their comrades, are usually content to rely on their individual judgments rather than to appeal to any universal theory of greatness in poetry, and, considered dispassionately, it would be easy to support the view that critics select their canons of art to justify their preferences that they formed when their minds were still receptive and unhardened by the inhuman task of criticism. To take a handful of poets at random, it seems impossible to lay down any one theory of poetry that will support the undeniable greatness of Herrick, Burns, Blake, Keats, Browning, Swinburne, and Meredith. And it may be noted that the laureate, who writes as a critic and not as a poet, while treating of poetry from the academic standpoint, does not dare this ultimate adventure. He is content to arrange poetry in classes and assure us that reflective poetry is greater than lyrical, and that epic poetry is the greatest of all. Even if we are to accept these dogmatic assertions, I can imagine no sane reader of poetry regulating his preferences by doctrine of this kind. To Mr. Austin, the comparative popularity of lyrical poetry is a matter for keen regret. To me, so far does personal prejudice count in these matters, it is a healthy sign, since it suggests that those who read poetry today do so for pleasure rather than from a sense of duty. But if for no other reason, I would mistrust Mr. Austin's canons on account of the extraordinary conclusions to which they lead him. Probably most foreigners would agree with Mr. Austin that Byron is the greatest English poet since Milton. But poetry is the one possession that a nation cannot share with its fellows, and the countrymen of Keats and Shelley, of Browning and Swinburne, must perforce keep the enjoyment of their rarer inheritance to themselves. Nor do his canons help Mr. Austin to fare better on smaller points. Thus, when he wrote that, no poet 
of much account as ever obscure he had clearly forgotten browning blake and the shakespeare of the sonnets the sonnets are occasionally obscure because in them shakespeare is expressing very intricate and subtle emotions quite beyond the range of ordinary lovers browning is obscure because his mind was an overcrowded museum in which his thoughts could not turn round without knocking freakish ornaments and exotic images off the shelves blake was obscure as wordsworth was often inane through trusting too much to inspiration great poetry is not obscure but the ranks of the great poets supply exceptions to all generalizations again mr austin finds it strange that two such great poets as dante and milton should suffer from a total lack of humor this opens up a fruitful field of speculation but probably this deficiency is the rule rather than the exception coleridge wordsworth keats shelley blake tennyson and swinburne all lacked it though some of these poets tried to be funny at times browning had a sense of humor but it may be doubted whether it did his poetry any good shakespeare had enough humor for fifty men of letters but he had everything mr alfred austin has not a sense of humor though he sometimes indulges a cumbrous spirit of gaiety that recalls mr pecksniff in his moments of relaxation no i do not believe in canons of art save if you will of a vague and ineffective character that leaves artists free to do what they like nevertheless the school of criticism to which mr austin belongs being powerful these days i think it would be a goodly task to prepare a list of aphorisms to hang by the bedside of critics of poetry mine would be something like this one a good critic is a man who likes good work and by dint of his enthusiasm is empowered to perform miracles teaching the blind to see and the deaf to hear two there are two kinds of poetry good and bad minor poetry is a phrase used by incompetent critics who dare not oppose their judgment to the possible contradiction of posterity three to artists who can treat them greatly all times and all truths are equal a poet of the first order raises all subjects to the first rank swinburne four if the poet's intellect gives power and direction to his work his emotions supply the force that creates it with most men the emotions become exhausted or sophisticated at a comparatively early age hence most poets have done their best work when they were young five the aphorism that poets are born and not made is merely an untruthful expression of the fact that not every one can become a poet by taking pains it would hardly be excessive to say that the first task of every artist is to create his own genius it is our misfortune that most artists have neglected to do this six poets who try to teach in song have derived small benefit from their suffering seven we have all endured the man who sings because he must there is something to be said for the man who sings because he can eight the wise critic will always approach poetry on his knees even though he ends by sitting on it nine bad poetry is not nearly so harmful as bad criticism of poetry and so on it would be possible to fill a number of pages with such things without saving one critic from the quenchless flames the only sane method by which to become a good critic of poetry is to love poetry that is why professor saintsbury's history of english prosody seems to me to be a great book i think he has the most catholic appreciation of poetry that any man not excluding the poets themselves can ever have achieved and he is free from the poet's inevitable prejudices the first volume may be skimmed over advantageously by any one not specially interested in prosody as a science but the second and third volumes should be read and re-read by all lovers of english poetry such a critic may well reconcile poets 
to criticism. And this brings me to the vexed question of the utility of critics. It seems to me clear that critics can be of little service to men of genius or even to artists of real ability. But as middlemen between artists and the general public, they are unhappily necessary. It is often forgotten how far the reading public today is dependent on the critics to tell it how many of the monstrous multitude of new books are worth reading. Poetry is very badly treated by the press in general because there is no money in it, and the daily newspapers prefer to devote their literary columns to reviews of novels written in batches of six by elderly unmarried ladies between breakfast and lunch. But it must be added that the bulk of the criticism of new poetry that does appear in the periodical press is surprisingly well done. The only pity is that there is not more of it. End of section 27、section、28 28 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. Montjoy. Mountjoy lies in a deep valley of the mountainous district known as the Eiffel. The little town is built on a bend of the river Roer, which is really one long waterfall from one end to the other, and is always turning its bed as if it were looking for a hairpin. Like all mountain streams, it becomes a raging torrent in winter time after a thaw, which perhaps accounts for my impression that half the houses in the town are falling into it and the other half are clapping out. With glistening walls and water reed in the crannies of their roofs. Wherever the townsfolk go in the valley, they hear the breathless song of their river. It rings in the ears of newborn babies. It calls after the dying through the closing gates. On Sunday nights, when the young men have come home from the factories at Aix to meet their girls, who work in the silk factories at Montjoy, the river absorbs the sound of their mirth. And since it's a merry river, its voice is unchanged. These silk factories are the last word in a commonplace industrial story. At one time, Montjoy was famous throughout Europe, says the guidebook for the manufacture of cloth, and the town displays many fine old houses where the manufacturers lived in the years of their pride. For over two hundred years, Montjoy flourished, and within the narrow limits of the valley ground became so scarce that the townsfolk built elaborate walls to make little terraces on the precipitous hills where they might grow cabbages. But the railway came too late to Montjoy, and the competition of manufactories more happily situated killed the cloth trade. And for a while, at least, the kitchen gardens on the mountain side must have been unnecessary. Now Montjoy has recovered a little of its old posterity, the girls making silk and the boys working all week at Aix. But the fact remains that in fifty years the population has fallen from three thousand to seventeen hundred. The silk manufacturers have bought the old factories and left them idle to forestall possible competition. It is to this decline in its posterity that Montjoy owes much of its picturesqueness, for during the last hundred years it has not been worth anybody's while to build new houses, and the little town has crossed a century of wild architecture unscathed. I have never been in any town that felt so old as this. Even though it is lit by gas, and devout persons have built a hideous little chapel on one of its hills above it, its narrow streets paved with cobbles and its half-timbered houses projecting over the footway, carved sometimes with pious observations in Latin and approached by sagging steps adorned with elaborately wrought handrails, create an atmosphere of matter-of-fact, unromantic antiquity. Which is far more impressive than the glamour with which artists endow their conceptions of the past. In the June sunlight, there was nothing mysterious about Montjoy. It rather convinced me that possibly the Middle Ages are not an invention of the historians. By day, the young people were all at work, and the streets were given up to centenarians and kittens. Who would have looked very much the same a few hundred years ago as they did then, so that it was easy to give a handful of centuries back to time. And to play at being my own ancestor. In half an hour, I had forgotten wireless telegraphy, the phonograph, googly bowling, and all our valuable modern inventions, and was able to walk through the streets with only a casual eye for the queerness of the architecture. But when night falls, Montjoy is full of ghosts and shapes of the dead. 
to revert to the houses they first opened my eyes to the possible poetry of slates and conquered my normal english aesthetic prejudice in favour of tiles between the wide chimneys the slates are spread like butter on a new loaf in ambitious and tumultuous waves they are local slates of a delicate colour so that form the hills of montjoy resembles a colony of brooding doves and it is easy to fancy that if one threw a stone into their midst the sky would be darkened by flapping wings and the valley would be left untenanted and desolate but it is guarded by two ruined castles one the mere shell of a watch-tower the other a beautiful and imposing ruin that will be a desirable residence for any reincarnated seigneur by the time the state has finished spending money on its restoration in chivalrous days this castle was besieged no less than six times but now the hills are only garrisoned by enormous slugs the black ones are longer than the brown ones but they are not so fat the black slugs are like silk umbrella tassels the brown ones are like dates most interesting to me than the conventional ruins of castles was a large disused cloth factory for while it is natural that a castle should be ruined a factory in decay disturbs our trust in the performance of our own inventions it is so large that the little boys had become tired of breaking the window panes and many of them were still intact but through the gaps it was possible to see the looms standing idle under their coverlet of dust the engines grown hectic in the damp mists of the river and the whitewash peeling off the walls like soapy flakes on these walls the work girls have written their names and the names of their lovers and i wondered how many tragic separations there must have been when the cloth no longer paid in montjoy and half the inhabitants went somewhere in search of work unhappily i discovered the significant sculpture in the company of a man who was labouring an aesthetic theory that it was necessary to have visited nuremberg in order to understand wagner and disturbed my sentimental speculations with idle babblings on music and architecture i told him that wagner would have been far more interested in the cloth factory than in nuremberg and that a man who could look at it unmoved was capable only of imitative artistic emotions which of course is true of most men but i made no convert even though i pointed out to him the oil cans still standing where the engineers had put them down for the last time and the nails where the girls had hung their coats in winter there are moments when i hate cathedrals and fine pictures because they make men blind one evening i went up to the factory alone to look for ghosts the cows were being driven down from the hills with a pleasant noise of bells and the river was singing huskily as though the mist had given it a sore throat as the darkness came on i would not have been surprised if the deserted buildings had throbbed into spectral life spinning cloth of dreams for markets of dead cities but they held mournfully aloof from me and the world like a spanish grande wrapped in a threadbare coat until a little old woman came out of one of the outbuildings and told me a story in a sad voice she had worked there as a young girl and when the smash came those who lived on the premises were allowed to stay there rent-free but they had all gone one by one and now she was alone in the midst of the great buildings that had filled her life since she was twelve years old it was hard to believe that she was not one of the ghosts whom i had been seeking and i returned to the town feeling as though i had nearly guessed its secret montjoy is in germany an hour and a half by train from aix la chapelle and within a day's walk of the belgian frontier i descended the precipice one fine evening of june in the company of a mad belgian architect and found it waiting for me at the foot it had waited a thousand years and it will still lie expectant of the man who shall make it his own when the hand that writes these words is fast once more after so brief a period of freedom in fetters of incorruptible dust the works of man last longer than man himself though it be but a little longer and if these houses tell us that our forefathers like ourselves built shelters wherein they could love secure from the gusty winds and the cold of the world we are yet aware of a shy conviction that these graying and furrowed stones possess some deeper significance that eludes our judgment made hasty by the fewness of our years if these ruins could speak the guide-book says regretfully when all men know that they are never silent though we cannot linger with them to hear their message if the past would cease to trouble our hearts with its sweet and poignant mutterings we might succeed in mastering the present in overcoming the reticence of the days to come i climbed down into montjoy on a fair evening of june and after a fortnight a fortnight as short as a sunny hour i climbed out of it back into a restless and unfinished world 
and so it might be thought I had finished with Montjoy, and Montjoy had finished with me. At one time this might have been true, but now I know that I am a slave of my dead hours, and shall escape my servitude no more. Like all men, I am a thousand men, and one man of me wanders still in those steep, uneven streets, looking at the faces of houses, and waiting for the hour when they shall disclose their secret. Once in a dream, I found time sitting in a garden, and with a dreamer's courage, I raised his shaggy eyebrows to peer into his eyes. They were as gentle and kind as a dog's. Perhaps the magic charm of old houses preserves the love and commandership of the men and women who have lived in them. Perhaps, when my spirit wanders by night in Montjoy, it is cleansed and quickened by the fellowship of the immortal dead. End of section 28《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
and the carriage was filled with the acrid scent of a November bonfire. He saw children beating at the edges of the fire with uprooted bushes, and a pall of smoke borne up on the heavy air. But the train ran on and brought him to the sea. Like most men who work for love, he had never thought of taking a holiday since he had been his own master. Wherever he had gone in the world, his work had gone with him, and the emotions bred of his resolution to do nothing for a month were new to him. Freed from his concern with words and phrases, his mind saw a life in greater detail, and he was curiously conscious of the shapes and colors of things. He had chosen a sophisticated little watering place on the Belgian coast for his holiday, where, side by side with the row of tall hotels that stood like a great wall against the sea, the sand dunes upheld the blue sky with their crests of pale gold like the hair of Flemish fisher girls. The lemon-colored beach was inlaid with bathing machines of a hundred hues, and below the dunes the great black fishing boats lay high and dry on the sands the pennants of their weathercocks fluttering softly in the wind that blew from the sea. The shore was studded with the figures of men and women, and the children were trampling down surf with their brown feet. Other children were flying kites, and the air was full of strange birds that plucked impatiently at the cord that bound them to earth, and when they succeeded in breaking it, fell to the ground, too weak to make use of their freedom. Behind the little town lay the tranquil plains of western Flanders, a fertile land of canals and farms and windmills, and far off the horizon he could see the purple towers of Bruges. In his new mood for holiday-maker he looked at his companions in the town with interest. They were gay and cosmopolitan and seemed to have been making holiday for years. The grave faces of the fishermen contrasted oddly, with this light-heartedness. Perhaps they were dreaming of long winter months, when the town was their own and the only good Flemish was heard in the reticent streets, when the North Sea roared in Flemish against the breakwaters that murmured now in conversational French to please the children of the visitors. The fishermen stood apart in silent groups, waiting for the tide to release their boats. The artist would have liked to talk with them, but he knew no Flemish. The red sun set into the sea, the laughing crowd split into families and went into dinner, and the artist was moved by a sudden sense of loneliness. Everyone in the place seemed to be gregarious. The visitors, the fishermen, even inanimate objects, the hotels, the boats, and the bathing machines formed themselves naturally into flocks. He shivered and climbed down the beach to make friends with the sea. The tide came in rapidly on the gently sloping sands, and when the tongue of a ninth wave licked his boots, he thought of the trusting advances of a large and amiable dog. This sea was a tame beast that made the great sea wall and the elaborate backwaters appear ridiculous. It hardly had the force to overcome the sand castles that the children had left behind them to guard the deserted beach, and in its gentle approach it brought him shy presents of fragile shells and bushels of seaweeds like baby's nosegays but it pressed him back foot by foot and presently the swart fishing boats hoisted their sails and crept out one by one under the sky already faintly powdered with stars an orchestra struck up a waltz above him on the dig and he saw that the windows of the hotels were blazing with light and the guests were dancing with the shadows of the esplanade as yet he was content to taste the holiday spirit timidly, for it seemed to him strong drink for anyone who was not accustomed to it. A man may not learn in a moment to talk aloud to strangers, to substitute laughter for thought, to dance under the stars, and to patronize the sea. So the artist kept to himself on the fringe of the crowd, and smiled encouragingly to himself to prove that he was making holiday. It would be pleasant he thought, after a month of unsuccessful struggle, to be merged in this universal unconsciousness. These people could express themselves efficiently by doing nothing at all. Perhaps he could win the secret of their joyous self-satisfaction in a place where even the sea was only a blithely insignificant tourist. He felt the passionate longing of every artist 
to enjoy life for its own sake. When the orchestra commenced the seventh waltz, he had left the dancers and turned inland along a dusty road that stretched monotonously level across uneventful fields. The night had not succeeded in enriching this dully prosperous plain with her mystery. The sparse trees did not bear themselves as giants. There were no mists to change the crop pasture lands into violet lakes. Every dusty twig, every sandy blade of grass stood revealed as by the light of a grey November day. And then he came up to a great flock of sheep that was grazing its way along the wide grassy borders of the road. He heard their teeth tearing through the tough grass and the barking of the sheepdogs on the skirts of the flock. Presently he overtook the three shepherds with their long poles and coats of undressed sheepskin. They pointed aloft and cried something to him in Flemish, and following their gesture he saw the red light high up in the sky. The boys had sent up a fire balloon from the beach below the town, and now it had dwindled to the size of a great red star. The artist looked at the sheep, at the three shepherds, at the new star that shamed all the lesser lights of heaven. Then he hurried back to his hotel and started writing. He realized that in a life so short, in a world that at every turn of the road could prove significant, there was no time to cease from effort. Below him on the esplanade the orchestra was tuning up for the fourteenth waltz, and the scraping of their bows disturbed the whispering of the gentle sea. His holiday was over. End of section 29「Section 30 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Olson. Monologues by Richard Middleton. Commercial Literature. This is an age of improving literature. Messrs. Shaw, Goldsworthy, Chesterton, Kipling, and Macefield have already improved us considerably, and will no doubt continue to do so. And this is as it should be. But since a changeless diet of lesson books is unwholesome for the literary student, we may allow ourselves now and again to rest our minds with that kind of literature that leaves us as imperfect as it finds us. French kickshaws are sweet to the palate after a surfeit of your funeral baked meats, and it is probably true that the demand for light fiction increases as our novelists grow more serious. I doubt whether I should have enjoyed my catalogue of bulbs so much if I had not just read that depressing masterpiece, Sister Carey. It supplied my mind with a bridge, whereby to pass from autumn to spring without suffering from the fogs and east winds and rainy muggy nights of our English winter. And fitly enough, the cover was adorned with a spring-like picture of a pretty Dutch girl, the real article and not the creature in a striped petticoat that prances gracelessly at English music halls. Only, the artist had not given her a large enough mouth to satisfy my craving for naturalism. For I have noticed that in the low countries, even the pretty girls can make one bite of an apple. The photographs of flowers with which the book was illustrated were very satisfactory. For the beauty of hyacinths and tulips and daffodils depends on their form rather than their colour. And they lose little by being reproduced in black and white. But even better than the photographs was the letterpress, which had evidently been written by a Dutchman with an equal enthusiasm for flowers and the English tongue. The merits of his prose can only be illustrated by quotation. The ubiquitous sparrow is the gardener's most inveterate enemy, for of good in the garden he does little or none, while of irreparable damage he annually does much. Sparrows strip our yellow crocuses of their petals, Notwithstanding the possibility of much of the beauty being destroyed by these marauders, it is indefensible to omit crocuses from the garden. In a similar spirit, he cries, Can anyone imagine what our gardens, greenhouses and conservatories would be like in spring if we had no tulips? The dull corner is enlivened by their presence, and the bright place is made still brighter. Moreover, we can have brilliant effects without putting our hand into our pockets to a very serious depth. How kindly, 
and humanly and wisely he writes of miniature hyacinths. In comparison with the typical Dutch hyacinth, it is fair to say that the miniatures are toys, and are not therefore worthy of serious attention. For one purpose they no doubt have a substantial value, and that is for children who, while small themselves, may prefer a small rather than adult bulb. This is a phase of bulb growing that might well be accorded much greater encouragement, for the production of really excellent miniature hyacinths is well within the powers of the little ones, whose interest in flowers is beyond question increased when they can watch the progress of their own nurslings. With daffodils, as he reminds us, there is a beautiful latitude in price. We can pay thirty guineas for some highly extolled novelty, or we can have a thousand sound flowering bulbs for as small a sum as one and a half guineas. Common, someone may say. Yes, but if planted in the grass in the wild garden or the woodland, they will make a lovely display. It is difficult to stop quoting man who can write of the leaves of a plant showing signs of going to rest of hardy spring flowers that make their lovely appearance every year. And who can describe a flower, amaranth red maroon stripes, and all tigered over with black? Let us leave him with his chaste poet's narcissus, which is beloved of everybody. Grow them by hundreds in the garden, and by thousands in the grass of the woodland, and their beautiful flowers will never fatigue the eye. Incidentally, this last is a flower that I should recommend for the gardens of critics. In the course of my wanderings in this charming catalogue, I have found other bulbs that should also appeal to the Catholic student of literature. I shall search his garden next spring for the hyacinths named after Lord Macaulay, Charles Dickens, and Voltaire, for Alfred Tennyson and Sir Walter Scott, their crocuses, and for John Davidson daffodils. His tulips must be none other than your tall and stately Darwins, though perhaps a partial exception might be made in favour of those named after Thomas More. In this way, flower beds might be made as significant as a man's bookshelves. It is strange how poorly an English catalogue compares with these enthusiastic pages from Holland. The home product is better printed, and the photographs are better reproduced, but the letterpress is pedestrian, and lacking in that essential quality that the late Mr. J. M. Singh called joy. It cannot be denied that the English tradesman has an extraordinary contempt for considerations of style. The moment a Frenchman has anything to sell, he coins a phrase about it, and nine times out of ten the phrase is poetical. During the recent heat wave, a man who sold fans in the streets of Paris christened them the Little North Winds, a flight of fancy of which a London street hawker is certainly incapable. Nor does the catalogue of an English bulb importer remind me of Bacon's essay on gardens, as it very easily might. Nevertheless, there are not wanting signs to cheer the student of commercial literature. I do not greatly care for the newer kind of advertising that apes the impertinent familiarities of a deplorable school of journalism. But it pleases me that Messrs. Whiteley should persuade me to buy their rose bushes with a quotation from George Herbert. It is even more delightful that the underground railways of London should invite me to visit Covent Garden or the Imperial Institute by means of a quatrain of Fitzgerald's Omar. The application may not be obvious to anyone who has not seen their subtle leaflet entitled The Rose. Indeed, it may not be very clear to those who have, but the intention of this and similar leaflets is excellent. The man in the tube should feel flattered at being approached in so cultured a fashion. In the day when all our acknowledged writers shall have become preachers or philosophers, perhaps the young men with a theory of beauty and no theory as to the economic conditions of the poor will be permitted to employ their perverse gifts in the preparation of catalogues. They will do it very well, forming new unions between adjectives and nouns, and ransacking their souls to find the true colours and shapes of things. The catalogue as an artistic form hardly exists today, but it is certain to make its appearance sooner or later. For instance, there is no reason why a catalogue of fire irons should not be as emotionally and artistically significant as a necklace of carved beads. It would touch on the natures of metals. 
how some metals are able to resist fire, while others preserve a polished and charm the eye. It would quote Mr. Max Beerbohm's essay on fire, the raging animal that we keep in cages in our houses, and point out the need for instruments with which to awake and control and feed this animal. It would examine the characters of men, how one man will want a poker like a sword, while another will want a poker like a plowshare, if such a poker there be. It would liken the tongs to the hands of a miser, and the shovel to a beggar's paw thrust out for alms. It would remind the elderly that the fire guard round the nursery fire is a lattice window through which young eyes can see half the wonders of fairyland on winter nights. Fire ships and palaces of flame, lurid caverns inhabited by goblins with red eyes and bodies of smoke. Really, it would be great fun to write a catalogue like that. End of section 30. Section 31 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. A monologue on love songs. I think the people who expect you to make fine poetry out of motor cars and the telephone and old age pensions are very foolish very foolish indeed it never has been done it will never be done all the great poetry of the world has been concerned with birth and love and death they are the only things significant enough for so rare a medium of expression and of course they are not really worn out at all they are new every day every hour it is not because of that that people no longer read poetry he stirred his glass with a circular turn of the wrist that pulls the heavy dranadine up through the soda water the lovers flock along the boulevard walking two by two as if they were already bound yes i have read your poems and i thought they were very pretty some of them seemed to me to have been felt I think you must have been in love with something or other when you wrote them, but what you were in love with, whether it was a girl or an idea of a girl or yourself or something that you had found in a book, I really don't know. And that is my criticism of nearly all the love poems that has ever been written. Oh, I know that you speak of her lips and her mouth and other bits and pieces of her body. It was a good day for poets when they first thought of doing that, and that really has something to do with love. Though there is a set of infamous rascals who pretend it hasn't, but it isn't all when you sum up the emotional units that compose a love affair. You will find that it is only an appreciable fraction of the whole it is the absence of other elements that makes your poetry artificial you admit that it isn't all when you fill up your poems with flowers and stars despair and desire and eternity and things of that sort the necessity is disastrous for it makes your poems inhumane and love is the most human emotion we enjoy yet when the lovers come to you for news of your passion you give them only a geographical chart of your mistress and a handful of insignificant symbols what is the use of these to charles when his increased salary were moldy with her new muff they know that all these things have little to do with love what they want is the expression of the poet's passion conveyed in terms that they themselves can understand i would not make it the final test of poetry but it seems to me that any really good love poem should be comprehensible to any intelligent lover without lamprey please of course you seen in good company swinburne's poems are often called erotic but their passion is purely intellectual and a nation that was dependent on the first series of poems and ballads for their knowledge of love would die of inanition he talks to a woman and a statue in exactly the same tone of voice and when we have become accustomed to the brilliance of his technique we realize that he has read about love in a naughty greek book most of you young poets end by creating the same impression except that we feel as a rule that you have read your greek book by aid of a crib 
What I want, what every、uh, everyone else wants, is evidence that you were in love with a real girl in a real world when you wrote your poems. Then they become interesting, alive. But the conventions that you have borrowed from other poets give them the air of academic exercises. They're pretty, ingenious, which you will, but you and your large-eyed lady appear only as discomfited ghosts who have been bitten by some quaint mythological insect called love. You must remember that nearly everybody has been in love at one time or another, and that writers of love poetry must be prepared to face an extraordinary number of well-informed critics. Well, you poets make love subtle, remote, mysterious. Well, all the world knows everything that is to be known about it. Nowadays, love is as comprehensible as the measles, as domesticated as a cat. We know its causes, its symptoms, its consequences. What are we to think when you tell us of starred heavens, and amethystine wings? Listen. It's no good dismissing this kind of criticism as mere philistinism. In love, we are all philistines or all poets. You can't say that your love is pure or more aesthetic than that of the shop boy because you have voluntarily accepted the conception of a universal god shooting his arrows with a democratic blindness to class restrictions. In effect. Your kisses are very like the kisses of ordinary men. It is not only poets who appreciate the eyes and lips and bosoms of their mistresses, and so far you are justified in regarding this as an important aspect of love. But there are other aspects, no less immediate, which you ignore because the other poets ignore them. Look out there under the trees where young men and women are walking up and down in pairs. The atmosphere is almost oppressive with love, but it is love without wings, without arrows, and with quick, keen eyes. If you were attempting to give prose impression of that very pleasant parade, I don't think you would write about eternity or the pastels of roses. It would be far more to the point to write about the little bags the girls carry on their wrists. In every one of them, there is a change. For a franc, a lens handkerchief, two or three letters, and a small powder box with a looking glass lid. They look in the glass to make sure they are pretty enough to meet their lovers. For me, a love poem ought to be resemble one of those little bags and contain the same thing, passion. But I wager the love letters are passionate in love, my friend. It is only you young dreamers who try to keep passion in a watertight compartment. Away from the ordinary emotions of life, in reality, it is always mixed with powder, lace handkerchiefs, and five-franc pieces. To think that in all your hundred love poems you have not once spoken of money! No, I'm not being cynical. There is an economic side to love, as there is to all other human relationships. You fall in love with a woman much richer or much poorer than yourself, and you realize that only too well. And the looking glass element enters too, not only for the women but also for the men. Those young fellows out there are pleased enough to be well dressed, and of course, a girl in a new hat is not a girl one met yesterday. A little extra peacockry is one of the commonest symptoms of love—a natural desire to look one's best, if you prefer it. But you haven't a word to say about it. But when it is lightning up time for glowworms, the lanes are crowded with poets. Have you ever seen a glowworm? Ugly little beggars they are, as brittle as lizards. For me, a shop assistant in his new brown boots, or a factory girl with her first big hat, is far more striking spectacle. That is love's livery, as it is worn by human beings, and I find it more convincing than your armor or your nasty clinging draperies. I remember once seeing a telegraph boy talking to a girl in the Strand, and being taken aback by the sight of his smooth young face blazing with passion. Now the only significant thing about a telegraph boy is his uniform. 
But if you had had the same impression as I had, and had given birth to one of your poems, you would have said nothing about his uniform, and would probably have called him vaguely a youth, trilling the hideous chains of monstrous civilization. With the best will in the world, your readers could not have recaptured your impression. They would not have seen what I saw, the flushed, eager face, the desperate, twitching hands leaping out of a wooden body, all straight lines like a child's drawing on a slate. They would not have seen the contrast between his crisped fingers and his inflexible belt, between his polished boots and his face dabbled with splotches of color and shades of perspiration. Your sacrifice, all the beauty of your impressions to immediate beauty of words or to conventional standards of aestheticism, that is why flesh and blood lovers laugh at you when grown too old for poetry. You turn critic and say that all the possible love poems have been written. As a matter of fact, poets have hardly started to write about love yet. A few phrases of Shakespeare's on jealousy. A few fine moments of Robert Browning awed how the most commonplace of poet lovers knew more about love than the whole row of passionate singers, a handful of old songs, a little Burns, and what's left beside. Meredith tried, but when he treats of love, he fails at the poetry. So does Commentary Patmore, who might have made a fine thing of the angel in the house. If a course of modern French po novels had taught him to distinguish between his real emotions and the emotions he thought he ought to feel, today there is A. E. Houseman with his Shropshire lad. I may have forgotten something, but it seems to me that that is the only book of English love poetry which an intelligent woman would not find silly and high falutin. And remember that if at this illusion end we come to believe that love is a masculine emotion rather than a feminine, the women always understand it better than the men. If they only knew how to write, what love songs they would give us! Sappho is still there with all her yearning songs that the careless centuries have mislaid. What we all want now is the poet big enough to throw overboard the conventional knickknacks. The new art vocabulary, the tight-laced mattress, the Birmingham relics of dead ages, with which you youngsters are cumbered, like the white knight in Alice through the Looking Glass. Of course, it isn't easy. Walt Whitman was a big man, but he threw the poetry overboard as well. And only the born deaf and the mentally deficient can call the American Rousseau a poet. End of section thirty-one. Section thirty two of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. Conversational Misers. In our experience, modern writers do not shine in conversation as did, if we are to believe their contemporaries, the great men of the past. Nowadays, the great novelist speaks dryly about copyright and censorship. The great poet talks about his dinner. And after an evening spent in their society, we must fall back on Stevenson's essay, Talk and Talkers, if we wish to preserve the conviction that conversation can be an art. Our modern Johnsons make whale-like noises only in their articles. And our modern goldsmith, but we have no modern goldsmith, would talk like poor Paul in recurring volumes of reminiscences. To sparkle in conversation is now the mark of literary mediocrity, and our great men unpack their hearts in words, in their notebooks, and in their private diaries written for publication. Perhaps they are not so lavishly provided with good things as their illustrious forebears, and cannot afford to be generous. Perhaps they are afraid of appearing arrogant to lesser minds that may not sparkle, but it is certain that the present-day hero-worshipper must expect to find his hero reticent. Possibly, if washerwomen could read shorthand, they would find the souls of these thrifty giants expressed on their cuffs. We who have spent an evening in their unimpressive society can only say that we have heard no word of them. 
Of course there are rare exceptions, but we fancy that few people would be found to contend that this is an age of accomplished talkers. Yet if we are not strangely inferior to our ancestors, we must suppose that the spirit that they expressed and talked now finds another outlet. Perhaps every other man we meet is a mute and glorious peeps. Or it may be that the modern taste for writing works of fiction marks the thankless doom of our lost conversationalists. At all events, in support of the theory that men and women write the things that once upon a time they would have been satisfied with saying, an agreeable piece of evidence lies under our hand. It takes the form of three fat red notebooks filled with the handwriting of a man who prided himself, we should infer, on its almost painful neatness. He was a schoolmaster, one of those luckless schoolmasters who do not find boys sympathetic, and wander the dreariest of exiles through the wastes of school life. Throughout this mass of unconnected notes, for his respect for form did not extend beyond occasional phrases, his references to his pupils are almost without exception gloomy. He finds his boys lazy, ill-mannered, snobbish, and normally so untruthful that he repeatedly makes the fatal mistake of disbelieving their assertions when they happen to be true. Because of this lack of justice, the boys call him Jeffreys behind his back, and he notes the fact without comment. Yet, like many people who do not like boys, he was evidently passionately fond of children and sweetens his pages with strange little notes of their ways. Babies eat their bread and butter upside down in order to taste the butter. When children are sent to bed early, they make up their minds not to go to sleep. When they are lying awake in bed, they try to see how many they can count. When it is snowing, the children walk along with their tongues out to catch the flakes. Nellie hoards her new pennies until they are quite brown and spoiled. This is the true parable of the talents. I have to win the affections of children with sweets and little presents. Others can do it without this. Against these, we can only set one human observation on his pupils. There is an oddity in boys. Simmons played truant yesterday to play schools with his cousins. It will be seen that our schoolmaster cuts a not unamiable figure in his notebooks, in spite of the fact that as a master he clearly erred on the side of severity. He was, we may venture, a lonely sort of man separated from his fellows by a gulf of shyness, certainly disillusioned and certainly possessed of vague literary ambitions. Probably his notebooks were intended to provide materials for some half-conceived masterpiece, for here and there we can see him striving after the finished phrase. Yet often enough he has merely jotted down the heads of his thought, the roughest outline of his impression, so that we who lack the key seek in vain for his meaning. Even when the sense is clear, we feel sometimes that a link is missing between the writer and the written word. After a certain age, it is very necessary that our dreams should be good to eat, is a superficial cynicism that hardly fits his character as we have conceived it. And this, when we found him in the snow, his clothes and hair were stiff with frozen beer. When we lifted him, it sounded as though his bones were breaking. Is it a reminiscence or the climax of a tale? We scan the next item on the page for an answer and find only the poignant cry, How can I stop the barber blowing down my neck? As an artistic form, these notebooks are perplexing. The most coherent section, nearly a whole notebook, is devoted to his notes of a holiday in Paris. But he has hardly escaped the conventional discoveries that reward all inexperienced travelers. Here and there, however, his individuality crops up. He saw a blind man in the street who looked as if he saw strange sights in another world. And a drunken man in a cafe who raised his hat before the bar as before an altar. He examines the Mona Lisa and decides that she is not smiling and allows the Venus to convince him of the ugliness of human arms. To travel abroad, he notes, 
is like visiting the houses of a number of people whom one does not know very well. A trial for a shy man. The motor cars pass this hotel like a roaring wind, he writes conventionally enough, and then gives us an astonishing portrait of the proprietor. His thick lower lip gleams like a wet cherry between his mustache and his beard. There is a picturesque touch about the grisettes struggling with great bundles of linen as with drunken lovers. And then we come on an impression that lacks the revealing word. The people in the windy streets are like heroes on Japanese prints. Doubtless he had seen something, but he has not told us what he had seen. Very few of his notes are concerned with literature, but evidently he read a few French books while he was in Paris. He suggests that Dumas modeled the famous escape from the Chateau d'If on Casanova's equally famous escape from the prison of the Plums. And on Zola's oeuvre, he writes, It would seem that the clearer the artist's vision, the more certain it is that he will never do anything permanently satisfactory to himself, which goes to confirm the theory that he himself has literary dreams. It is typical of his method that he follows this reflection with the note, Today I saw a man whose waistcoat pockets were so large that his hands disappeared in them entirely. We are possibly wrong, but it is difficult to avoid the impression that the odd abruptness of his journal reflected a certain mental incoherence. On one page we find a quotation from Isabel Everhart on happiness a memorandum that the Charing Cross Road smells of raspberry jam and hot vinegar, a paradox on cowardice. A man may be afraid of blows, yet his moral cowardice may set him fighting with a stout face. And the extraordinary comment, P hates me because I challenge the luxury of his grief. There is, too, a curious mental contrariness about the man that makes his character difficult to grip. It was not modesty that led him to write, There are days on which the lowness of the clouds incommodes me and makes me feel cramped. Yet a page later we find him writing humbly, Ibsen says that the majority is always wrong, but I must try to remember that the minority is not always right. And in a still darker mood, I would like to exchange all my thrills and passions for a life without desire, without hope, and without regret. At times he realized that he was in the wrong minority. Poor man. We have lingered over these notebooks partly because they are interesting in themselves and partly because they supply a good instance of the harm people do to themselves in being reticent. It is clear that the writer was a man with a serious turn of mind, coupled with an odd, individual outlook on life, and failing the society of his likes, he expressed himself only in notes written for his own eyes, which is no kind of expression at all. For lack of impulse from without, such an impulse as we can all find in good talk, our disillusioned schoolmaster waned at the end to silent nothingness. He hardly even survives in his notebooks, for, as we have said, a large part of his notes are now meaningless. He is like one of those misers in whose coffers the impatient heirs find nothing but withered leaves. The fairies, who do not like misers, have substituted the sweepings of the forest for the sweepings of the city. In his lifetime, he hoarded the little treasures of his mind instead of sending them out to win interest, and now his notes crumble to dust and all his new pennies are spoiled and brown. Greater men than he are making the same mistake. End of section 32. Recorded by Bob Hamilton. End of Monologues by Richard Middleton.